Hey everyone, today we've got a great question from a viewer about what we might be able to learn from the world of creative real estate investing. Let's take a look. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. All right, so I got a great question from Mono who reached out to me over LinkedIn. I'll put the question up on the screen here. He says, Dear David, um, I wanted to express my gratitude for the enlightening content you've provided. I'm truly thankful to have come across your video. It has helped me to avoid a potential pitfall. Hey, that's the reason why I make these videos. Your expertise and insights are truly valued, and I'm curious to know if you believe that purchasing real estate investments through creative financing is a viable option for everyone. I'd like to share a YouTube link with you that details how the deal structure is formed. And he, you know, I, I crossed off the link there. I'm going to talk a little bit about the video, and I will put a link to the source video down below in the notes. He says, thank you again for valuable insight. Mono, great question. Thanks so much. And, and um, so when I got that question from Mono, I immediately had a bunch of ideas running through my head, and I went to the video that, uh, that he had pointed to, and... Um, it was about what they call buying a house subject to. And so what does that mean? It means buying a house subject to the existing mortgage that's already in place on the house, staying intact, and the buyer taking over the payments on that mortgage. And so the video that he pointed to was from a fellow named Pace Morby, who is, uh, uh, I've never heard of him before, but I watched the video. He's a real estate investor, and he's also got some coaching and training products that I have never checked out. But the, the video itself and how he explained it is very clear and concise, and I thought it was a good video. So <clears throat> this whole subject to idea is part of a world, if you haven't come across it yet online, uh, called creative real estate, uh, which is basically all of these different strategies and ideas outside of simply buying a property using cash or getting a mortgage and using a down payment to buy the property, right? That's sort of conventional how everyone normally does it. The, the creative stuff encompasses things like what I just mentioned, buying a house or buying a property subject to the existing mortgage stay in place, doing something called a lease option where you lease the property from its owner with an option to purchase at a predetermined price, using seller financing, which we're used to talking about here on this channel with respect to businesses. Um, and then, you know, with seller financing, uh, what ends up happening is the seller then ends up with a, a mortgage note. And, and there's a whole other subsector of this world of creative real estate called note investing, where there are other people who will then go and buy those mortgage notes secondhand, as it were, from the people who sold those houses. And those people will either hang on to them and through offering, you know, sort of different terms or price on the note, they'll be able to manipulate the rate of return, or they'll buy that note at one price and resell it to someone else who needs a lower rate of return, for example. Um, and then if you are owning a house and you want to sell it in a creative way, you can do, um, you know, you can also do a lease option. And I sold one of my first houses this way. And it was through online education, like the videos that Pace Morby is creating, that I learned how to do it. So I, I, again, I got kind of excited watching the video and it caused me to run over to the bookshelf. Where'd the bookshelf go? Well, you know, it's, it's right over here, right? So I ran over to the bookshelf and uh, found a few of my favorite books because you see, I got into this stuff back in the mid 2000s. Uh, to mid, early to mid 2000s when I was buying apartment buildings. And so I used to go to these, uh, at that time it was blog sites, where people would be writing about these concepts. And uh, some of my favorite books on the topic, uh, there's this one here from a guy named Lonnie Scruggs, uh, Deals on Wheels. And in fact, I made a video, sorry, it wasn't me, Chubby David made a video back in 2015 called My Failed Lonnie Deal. 
uh, when we'll put a link to it in here, um, where I described, you know, these deals and they're all about uh, mini homes or trailers, uh, depending on where you live. And uh, then there was uh, another one. So this is one that I got. This is copyright 1998 by Bill Broadbent and George Rosenberg. And this one's called Owner Will Carry. And it's about seller financing. And there's actually a description in here about a hybrid deal with a small business seller note too that I learned quite a lot from. Um, and then uh, there's this one here, uh, the Note Professor Notebook, which uh, shout out to Tom Henderson. Um, and if you go online, hpnotes.com is Tom's website. Uh, he's still putting stuff out. I think he does like a monthly newsletter, but he's all about the, the mortgage note investing side of things. And this book details all the different ways that you can make money if you can find someone with one of these seller finance notes that wants to, um, is willing to sell it, all the different ways that you can invest in this. So, so I've put a lot of time into learning about these strategies. Now, uh, let's get back to Mono's question because I, I want to point out a very specific thing in his question. So he says, um, I'm curious to know if you believe that purchasing real estate investments through creative financing is a viable option for everyone. And, and I think it's the E word there that we have to focus on, everyone. Um, so here's the deal with this stuff. Um, is it possible to do these deals? Absolutely. I've done creative real estate deals. I've sold a house uh, on a lease option. Um, I have counseled many business buyers to purchase businesses and then secure a lease with an option to purchase the real estate, which is a form of the thinking that comes from this school of thought. Um, yeah, it's possible. Uh, is it likely? Well, if someone happens to own a house that is in uh, you know, a very desirable house on a desirable street in a desirable neighborhood and they are in a position where they can offer it at a reasonable price, uh, they're certainly not going to sell their house subject to the existing mortgage staying in place. They're just gonna sell it in the conventional way. So in the Pace Morby video that Mono had referred me to, um, Pace does a really great job at explaining why the seller was motivated enough to do the deal in this way. And, and I wanna be very careful in and being very blunt in this. The seller has agreed to sell the home to another person and let that person take over the payments but the original owner, the seller's name is still on that mortgage, right? Think about that. So you're gonna hand over the keys to the house, you're gonna sell the house, you may, you may get some money on closing day for the house, but your name is also still on that mortgage. And now you're gonna go off to a new place. Uh, in, the, in the video, the person had a job change, so they're gonna move to a new place. And you're gonna trust that the person you sold the house to is going to always honor the commitments of that mortgage and, and do that. Right. And so and in a mortgage, there's probably some language in there usually uh, that says that if the title of the property changes, you're supposed to let the mortgage company know. Um, I would bet you in this deal that didn't happen. Right. So the mortgage company is still thinks that the person they let the money to is the owner of the house. And as long as everything goes OK, it's, it's probably all fine. So. Um, so you got to find a super motivated person that's willing to let all of this happen. Now, um, the other thing I want to point out it, it is just it, it may not be that easy to find a scenario in such as a, you know, a place where you're going to be able to buy this house subject to. Back in my parents' heyday when they were, you know, looking for houses in the late 70s, early 80s, interest rates were through the roof. And this kind of thing was really common because interest rates had gone up and if you had a a house with a mortgage that was at a really reasonable rate, people would want to buy the mortgage. My dad actually said this to me. He said people were not buying houses, they were buying mortgages. But one of the big differences in Canada is that, uh, here where I live, is that most mortgages are for five-year terms and at the end of the five-year term, you renew at the current rate. And so to agree to sell a house and leave your name on the mortgage, knowing that there was some, you know, just a few years left on it, is gonna be easier than someone who has a mortgage that might be a 30-year mortgage, which they could exist in the US, right? That's a really long time for your name to kind of be attached to something uh, where you could be liable in, in the case where the new owner doesn't make the payment, right? And that's what any lawyer, for example, is gonna warn that seller about is, hey, you know, here are all the things that could happen. Are you really sure you wanna do this? 
So um, let's talk about the legal and paperwork a little bit, because one of the things that I know that I did mention was something called a wrap mortgage. So one of these concepts in creative real estate is that if I owned a house and say I was going to sell my house for, uh, I'll use round figures, I was going to sell my house for $100,000 and I owed 50 on it. And let's say that I owed 50 and it was at 5% interest. And I was willing to make an investment in selling the property because I wanted to gain some, some leverage. Let's say I, I was willing to offer the house for sale with 100% financing at 10% interest. And so someone else came along and they said, I'll do that deal because I don't have any money for a down payment. So I could create what's called a wrap mortgage where I would write a mortgage for that person for $100,000 face value. They would pay me, but my mortgage would wrap around the mortgage I already had in place, the bank mortgage, which was at 5%. And that lower mortgage interest rate would provide leverage to my rate of return and I would earn a higher rate of return for the because of I was using the bank's money to kind of subsidize uh, my own investment in the hundred thousand dollar mortgage. I only have fifty thousand of my own equity in that deal. Now, so when I wanted to sell my first house, I went to my lawyer and I described this to him and I said, "Can I do that?" And he said, "Oh, he said that's a wrap mortgage." He said, "Yeah." He said, "That's uh, really easy to do fifteen years ago." And I said, "Why fifteen years ago?" And he said, "Well." Well, that's when we changed from a land registry to a land title system here in New Brunswick, right? And so one of the th things you need to highlight about all of this stuff is that all real estate is local. And so I noticed that Pace mentioned that he was in Arizona. So you can go online, you can find people that are talking about these kinds of things. And... <laughs> where they are standing is going to affect the rules that apply and even the methodology and the way that things happen. Like he described a title company uh, being sort of the, the people who take care of the transaction, all that kind of thing. And that's what happens in Arizona. But it's not what happens everywhere, right? In other places, there are different systems set up. And so if you're going to learn about this stuff, you really have to be keenly aware of what the rules are where you happen to be standing. And what does that mean? It means that you should probably have a relationship with a lawyer who knows this stuff and yeah it's gonna cost money to talk to them but run these things past a lawyer and it, you know it's and you may want to look for someone who's older especially if they were practicing in that 1980s period when we had these big changes in interest rates because they're gonna be more familiar with these ideas right some some newer lawyers may never have seen this kind of stuff before so so you have to be careful of the paperwork now this channel is not about creative real estate investing. And uh, while this is an exciting topic and there's lots of people who will make a lot of money from this, I want to circle this back to the world of small business. And so why might it be an interesting investment in time to learn more about this stuff? Well, once you start to understand some of these concepts and ideas, you can certainly start to apply them in the world of small business and small business deal making. That's that's what I have always done. And it's been one of my strengths. It's, it's been one of the ways that I've come up with ideas and solutions in deals that uh, other people would not have been able to think about. And in fact, it's those ideas from creative real estate that then came into the world of small business. And then I tried to apply them to other investing strategies that led to my first book, which is called Invest Local. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, I wrote that in 2014. And, um, you know, the stuff in there is just every bit as applicable today as it was back then. So if you want to increase your, your bandwidth or th ideas or thoughts about deal making stuff and time value of money and how to create these structures, read Invest Local. But I have helped people in the following ways in the world of small business through these ideas I've learned from creative real estate. So number one, I already mentioned was buying businesses and then not buying the real estate, but rather doing leases with options to purchase in the future. And so people will sometimes say, well, I wanna own the real estate because paying rent is like throwing money away. I'm, I've made many videos about why that is not necessarily true. However, uh, here's an idea that I want you to put in your hat and stew on for a bit. It is possible to build equity in a contract. What do I mean? Well. If you sign a five-year lease for a piece of commercial property 
And then you have an option to buy that property at a fixed price at the end or during that five-year lease. If you negotiate shrewdly enough, you can negotiate for a price for that building, which may be less than the fair market value of that building in the future, okay? Which means that contract is gonna build value. So you could then end up buying the building maybe for $100,000 less than it really is worth at that point in the future. So why do I bring this up? Well, the option contract itself then holds value. So even if you decided you didn't wanna own the property, you wanted to continue to lease, you could sell the option to someone else who might wanna buy the building, right? Okay, so that's a concept, that's an idea that you know I understand because of this world of creative real estate. Um, taking over payments on things. All kinds of people have done small business deals where they've assumed payments, whether leases or loans, on all manner of different kinds of equipment, which is basically identical to the subject two described in Pace's video that uh, I've put in the notes down below. Um, different ways to do seller notes. So, uh, you know, in the world of creative real estate, there's going to be conversations that you're going to find about seller financing. So I listened to all that kind of stuff years ago. And then... Uh, one day uh, I realized uh, that you could have more than one note. And then I realized uh, the different notes could be in a different order and have different characteristics and even secured against different things. So back in 2018, uh, Tom Henderson uh, was instrumental in getting me an invitation to come down to a convention in Las Vegas where I talked about um, small business notes as investable assets to a conference of people who were meeting to talk about real estate notes, the, these secondhand mortgages. And so one of the things that I said during that talk is I said, you know, you could buy a business and you could have more than one note or you could sell a business and you could have more than one note and you could put them in different order of priority at the deal and you could have certain collateral attached to the more priority notes rather than the lesser priority notes. And those more priority notes could then have more of an opportunity to be sold to an investor, for example. And so if you're trying to buy a business and um, you know, the seller is going to end up financing a huge part of it for whatever reason, um, and they say, you know, I really need money. Well, one of the things you could suggest, for example, is let's do multiple notes. We'll attach different security to the higher priority notes. And then after a period of time, that note maybe becomes a saleable asset that you can sell maybe after a year or two. Uh, and that'll be a shortcut for you to get more money rather than waiting for these notes to mature. Now, who is going to invest in that note, right? So let's get even more creative, right? So let's say that you have a holding company uh, and an operating company under it, and that operating company is the one making the small business acquisition. Uh, and then after a year or two goes by, um, then the person's like, well, now I wanna sell my note. Uh, where do I find an investor? Uh, potentially, maybe you personally become the investor. And you say, well, I'll buy that note with a $100,000 balance on it, uh, but uh, you know, I'll give you 90 for it, right? So you become your own note investor on the deal, and now you buy the debt of the operating company that you also own, right? So there's all these kinds of creative things that you can dream up. And, uh, you know, before doing that, of course, you want to talk with the CPA, understand all the tax implications, etc. But when you start to realize that you and your different companies are legal, uh, separate legal entities under the law, and that each of you can be doing different things with respect to the deals that you're doing, it can open up all new avenues for you to think about this stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, anyway, so do I think that uh, it is possible or probable that everyone's going to buy a house subject to with one of those low mortgages that people were getting two years ago? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that a lot of people uh, won't want to deal with the realities of that from a seller's perspective. And if people don't have to move, if they don't have to sell, that uh, they simply won't. They'll just stay in their homes. Um, it's going to be an interesting period, I think, if interest rates uh, go up any further, for sure. But um, I think we can learn a lot in the world of small business from what some of the practitioners in the world of creative real estate are doing. And with that, you know, Mono, I want to thank you for the question. If, uh, if there's some part of this conversation you think I've missed, please put it in the comments down below. I'd love to read those comments. And uh, keep the questions coming. 
2024 is an exciting year and I look forward to having more of these ideas and conversations with all of you. And with that, I'll say thanks and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses? Easy, go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor, Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.